Here's the review for the digestive system based off of the images provided by the anatomy and physiology revealed by McGraw-Hill. We will go through the features that I would probably ask you on an exam. The worksheet for the GI includes these pages. We will go through each of the pages individually. We'll take a single page where you have the features indicated here, and you should be able to find all of those features somewhere on a single page. Not all images will have every one of these individual features, but all those features should be found on each page. I'd like you to first do the worksheet on your own. Go through the images, look at the items listed, try to find as many of the features as you can, and then proceed with this video. You will learn a lot more if you initially make the effort. That way, when you see a corrected version or validation that you were correct, that actually imprints on your memory a lot more than just starting with the answers given to you. On the first page, we will go through these images. The first image, we can see this is actually from the esophagus. So this is a histological slide of the esophagus. The tissue here, as we can see the individual cells, is stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Below that is the submucosa, while this layer is the mucosa. This is also, this whole thing, is the esophagus. What we can see is the stratified squamous epithelial tissue is this dark purple inner component and it's all scrunched up until food gets in there. So food's gonna be in there in the white portion. On this particular slide of the esophagus, we have our dark purple area. This is gonna be our mucosa. This area is going to be our submucosa. This here is our muscularis externa, or you could break it up into smaller bits. We can call this the circular muscle layer, and this portion is the longitudinal. And so those two are subgroups of the muscularis externa. The longitudinal is always going to be the furthest out. This particular one is the gastroesophageal junction. We know this because we have our stratified squamous tissue of the esophagus in this region, and then we transitions into the portions here where we have columnar cells, which are more of a hallmark of the stomach. Stomach on this side, and we have our esophagus on this side. In this image, we actually see this is indeed the stomach, we have this layer is our mucosa. And I want you to notice we have actually this muscularis mucosa located here. So that's also part of the mucosa. So that's here, stomach, muscularis mucosa, and we did the stomach mucosa. Then beyond that, in the stomach, we will have the submucosa, that this more white colored area immediately adjacent to the submucosa, we will have the one muscle that's unique to the stomach along the GI tract because it's more of a three-dimensional pouch rather than a tube. We have the oblique muscle and it's immediately adjacent to the submucosa. That's our oblique muscle. And then we would have our circular muscle and our longitudinal. Those are all located there. This is a zoomed in view of the stomach mucosa. What I want you to be able to find here are these items here. So within the stomach mucosa, I would like you to know that the top is where we will have goblet cells. In the middle region, we will have our parietal cells. And at the lower portion, we will have our chief cells. 
on the next page of the worksheet, we will start with the duodenum. So this here is a duodenum. In here, what do we see? We can see villi. These individual things are villi. They're not the prettiest of villi, but that's what they are. That would also mean this region is our mucosa. That means this region is going to be the submucosa. And that means this here is our circular muscle, and this is our longitudinal muscle, which means it's the muscularis externa. And the most important part that's in here, I want you to know, are the Brunner's glands. These Brunner's glands are located here, and they are found within the submucosa. This is an extremely zoomed in view of a single villi. The only thing that I care about this is one that you know it's a villi, so it's got this shape, but the other, I don't see it on this list here, are the simple columnar epithelial tissue that actually make up the villi, as well as being embedded with the circular white areas, which is mucus being produced by goblet cells. This here is going to be the liver. The liver, we can actually see this portion in here, which is the central vein. And this is where we're going to have, let's put that clean blood, if we wanna call it, it's already filtered. And where is the central vein draining into? It's going to drain to the hepatic vein, which will then take it over to the inferior vena cava. The parts of the portal triad, which are located here. So this is the portal triad. It's in the adjacent corners of or within the liver. The individual components of the portal triad is we're going to do the hepatic artery. Looks like it will be right here. So this is going to be our hepatic artery. Our hepatic portal vein will be this one. It's nice and big, thin walled. The artery we can tell has a lot of smooth muscle. And finally, a ductile, which is a tiny duct. This is the bile duct within here. So the direction that the fluid goes, so the direction the fluid goes is blood comes into the liver by the hepatic artery, and it actually directs blood this way. So any waste, I'm just going to make waste being these black dots, are actually going to get filtered out by these sinusoids. So waste is going to be taken out of the hepatic artery. We have the hepatic portal vein also bringing blood into the liver to be cleaned. It's also gonna have waste within it, so it brings the waste out. So I'm gonna make waste as these little black dots as being brought out by the cells in there. The cells are known as sinusoids. And then what's bringing the waste away to this bile ductile and the waste is actually loading up on here. So all the waste is going into the bile duct pathway to take it away from the liver. So by the time it gets to the center part here, this is the central vein where it's clean, and all the junk and the waste goes out the bile duct. One thing I did want to point out when we got to this slide, this is a previous slide, this one is indeed from the jejunum. We don't see any Brunner's glands down here in the submucosa, and it has very nicely organized villi, which is a hallmark of jejunum, because its main job is absorption. When we go here, this is the ileum. We can see that villi are a lot less organized, a little more tattered. Within the ileum, we can actually see in this particular one a lymphatic nodule. If there are many lymphatic nodules together in a large concentrated area, that would be known as a Peyer's patch. But throughout the GI tract, we will have lymphatic nodules all over. It's just in the ileum, they can be more concentrated in the Peyer's patches. This, with all the white circles that we see here in the mucosa, and we actually see a beautiful little pink line there as being the muscularis mucosa, this is the colon. So this is from the large intestine. This is a more zoomed in view of the colon or large intestine. We see a huge amount of goblet cells here in the mucosa layer. And then we have our submucosa. 
And then we have our, actually this is a really excellent image of our circular muscle. And you can see here at the bottom, there's little dots and this is muscle cells coming out the screen at you. So this is our longitudinal muscle. And then together, those two layers obviously then would be muscularis externa. In this image, we're gonna focus on the oral cavity. Here we have our incisors, then our canines, yeah. canines. Then you have the premolars, and then our molars, which are a lot more developed further here, and likewise at the bottom. On the anatomy of a root is we have the crown, which is above the gum line. The neck is the transition here into the roots, and the roots obviously are what's going down into the bone component, whether it's the maxilla or the mandible. The cross-section of a tooth, we have enamel, we have the dentin, and we have the pulp cavity. So a cavity is when the enamel wears out due to acid, which comes from bacteria not brushing your teeth or a lot of acidic foods. If there's a hole worn through, bacteria make its way to the dentin, which is very soft. So bacteria then wear a hole away through here, and then now we have outside exposure to these nerve endings, and that's why cavities are very painful. The root canal is not the procedure, but actually the space within the roots that the nerves will travel through. In this image, we can see the parotid salivary gland located here by the ramus of the mandible, just by the masseter muscle. We can see the submandibular salivary gland, and here in this cutaway view, we can also see the sublingual salivary gland. This page will deal with the stomach and the abdominal cavity. On this portion, we obviously the esophagus. This is the stomach. We have the duodenum located here. On the stomach, we have the fundus, which is this portion here. The pylorus is this funnel region here or pyloric region. Let's see. We have the lesser curvature, which is superior, and then we have our greater curvature located down here. In this open view, we can still see our esophagus. We still see this, so here's the esophagus. Here's our duodenum. We have our fundus, which is this portion up here. The pylorus is right within here. And then now we can actually see the pyloric sphincter, which is this muscle area right here. It helps to keep the food into the stomach. And if you recall, um, secretin and coleokinin can actually cause this to close um, to prevent more coming out while the duodenum processes um, the food. So this here is a pyloric sphincter. It opens to let chyme out into the duodenum. Gastroesophageal sphincter is located up here between the esophagus and the stomach. Rugae are the folds located within the stomach. So when the stomach is empty and scrunched up, you'll see a lot of folds which are rugae. The folds within the small intestine, and we see them quite nicely here, are known as plicae circularis. And about the only other couple things we can see here is the um, common bile duct that's coming right here and we actually can see the pancreatic duct right here both of those are entering here the duodenum in this image in this image we can see the liver we can see the gallbladder that's going to be located there we see the stomach actually so here's the greater curvature of the stomach and that's located right here and hanging off of it, we have actually some of the greater omentum. You can't see the pancreas in this picture. We can see the, obviously, the intestines. This here would be the cecum. We can actually see the ascending colon going up. This is our hepatic flexure. We can see the transverse colon here and our splenic flexure. And then our descending colon coming down. And then this is the start of the sigmoid colon. And actually, this here is the bladder. 
Here's a zoomed in view where we can see the liver, we can see the gallbladder. What we have here is going to be the common hepatic duct that's coming down right here. So it's everything coming out of the liver. We have the cystic duct, which is a port going into the gallbladder. And then the common bile duct is what's coming out to bring it here to the sphincter of OD, which brings bile into the duodenum. In this picture, we can see some of these other items a little more clearly without the mess of a cadaver. So we go from the esophagus, don't know why I have the stomach listed there, so then we have our stomach. This portion here is the duodenum, and then we have other parts of the small intestine, which would be the jejunum, and the last part of the small intestine will be the ileum. Going through the checklist, we'll go through the stomachs, lesser curvature here, and obviously the greater curvature is going to be larger there. The portions of the colon, we will start here with the cecum. We can see right there is the appendix. And then we have from here to here, this would be the ascending colon. We would have the hepatic flexor. We have the transverse colon, and we have the splenic flexor. Then we have our descending, and we finally have our sigmoid colon. And then the last straightaway is the rectum. I want to point out haustra, and then I should also include the tinea coli. I don't really see it here, but the haustra are these pouches along the colon or large intestine. Haustra are formed because of the muscular stripe that is a hallmark of the large intestine known as the tinea coli. It's actually, there's a number of ways to spell that.